So I got a little ahead of myself with trying to do the final. But let's take a look at uh, programming. This is, you know, I'm not going to really spend a whole lot of time in here except to show you where the resources are. Because basically all you're doing with this particular um, module is you're going to do some simple copy and then change it, tweak it a little bit to make it your own. The one bad thing about Scratch, and that's what we'll be using, um, the one thing bad thing about Scratch, although they, they claim they're working on it, is it doesn't have Google Classroom integration. It's not the end of the world. You basically would just have the assignment, and kids then would put would click on the link, and then they could just drop in the link to their Scratch project. Uh, the nice thing about it is when you do that, then you can actually play or, or experience the project. But let's back up a little bit and talk about coding programming. One of the things that uh, the state of Kentucky has done a really good job with is trying to bring the whole idea of coding programming into the curriculum. We now have a statewide curriculum for coding and programming. What's the difference? The two words have kind of become synonymous in a lot of ways. Um, the thing that people get more snooty about is, is how you program. In other words, what do you use? Scratch is a beginning program language. It's called an OOPS, O-O-P. It stands for Object-Oriented Programming. And what it means, simply, is that an object-oriented programming language allows you to actually act upon a thing. In the case of Scratch, you can act upon the little sprites, the little pictures that we'll be using here in just a minute. Also, uh, the Scratch programming language now has hooks over into the Legos. Um, if you've never seen the Mindstorms, the NXTs, the EV3s, they basically have a little computer that you can then build into whatever your creation is, and then you can program it to do multiple things. In Jefferson County, we have something called the Robo Rumble, um, which I helped create, oh, golly gee whiz, 10, 10 11 years, 12 years ago. And we um, have always had, as the cornerstone of that, our Scratch competition, use, not Scratch, excuse me, our Lego competition with the kids using the NXT language. So the easiest way to do Scratch with Legos is using something called WeDo's which are these little toys that you can put together and then you can program them to do things. Now, there, of course, there are other uh, programming languages. Uh, Python is a true programming language, but still in Python, you're still writing code to do something else. And then there is the VEX computer programming language, which is called Robot C. It allows you to have sort of a drop-down window where you can pull over uh, code or you can write the code at the command line. And then when you're ready to graduate, um, you can start writing in C++. Code development, I think one of the things that we have to be careful about code development is when we have kids create things, um, we don't acknowledge the fact that they understand what they're doing already because they're playing games like Minecraft. If you go to this Our Code homepage, and I don't, are we still doing Our Code? This was something that started um, in the Obama years. But it has some really nice games experiences in here. So if you want to get serious about doing this with your kids and everybody has a, you know, some kind of device, then you can just drop right into here and find all the different um, beginning experiences you can do with coding from the R and Code site. It's good stuff. Good stuff. And then, of course, you've got the R and Code for Minecraft which will just be specifically about how to design inside of Minecraft. Uh, I don't think this is a cost anymore. Uh, I know Jefferson County, I think, was going to buy it, and then they realized it wasn't going to be a cost anymore, so they didn't do it. But let's go take a look at Scratchy Scratch. So Scratchy Scratch uh, began as, you know, it actually has beginnings further back than MIT. A young lady at Carnegie Mellon, I hope you heard that, young lady, at Carnegie Mellon was doing her PhD. And her PhD project was how to get girls engaged in programming and coding. She created a very simple program called ALICE, A-L-I-C-E, based upon Alice in Wonderland. And that was the first time that we saw someone actually 
write a program that would be as simple for kids to use, but could also be extremely complex. Scratch was the good folks at MIT's attempt to create a programming language that anybody could experience and at the same time could experience it at whatever level they want it to be. When I do Scratch with kids, I go in with the idea of game design. Because when you talk to kids about coding, this is what they think uh, coding is about, is designing games. That's fine. It gives me a doorway in. I remind them that what every game is, is a story. And so the first thing they have to do is to write that story for me. So we do that first. We design a story. We look at the characters. We look at setting. We look at the conflict. We look at resolution. We look at all those things that we can do inside a Scratch game. Now, we're not going to do anything that complicated for you because I just want you to see how it works because there's so much material out there on this. And if you really are fascinated by this and you want to borrow one of my books about Scratch design, you just let me know. But I'm going ahead and I'm going to lay out for you right here. This is the code. All you have to do is copy this code over into your Scratch screen and then change it just enough. So what do you mean by change it, Steve? Well, you look down here, you can see that our shark is going to move 20 steps. You can change that to 25, you can change it to 30, change it to 1. Please don't make it 1, you'll be bored to death. You can change it to 10, however you want to do it. You can change it. You don't have to use the polka dotted fish. In fact, you don't have to use a shark. If you want to make your game uh, an homage to a Game of Thrones and have the dragon that's in one of the sprites in here, and he can actually you know, flap his wings while he's moving around, do that. Same thing over here. The polka dot fish, you don't have to have a polka dot fish. You could make it a star fish. You could make it an octopus. Well, we do have an octopus. You can make it whatever you want to make it. Just change up a little bit about it. Okay? That's all you need to do. And you'll notice over here that what it's doing in this particular game is as long as you're eating the polka dot fish, you get one point. You see that? If you get a yellow fish, you get a big 10 points because they're harder to catch, I guess. And if you get an octopus, which you shouldn't because they're yucky, it'll kill your scores. You'll get back to them. Now, I'll get you started, but I'm not going to stand here and do this whole game. I, I shouldn't have to. So let me just go ahead and go to Scratch MIT. If you want to print out that, um, let me go back and show you that. If you want to print that out so you can have it in your hand, there you go. Okay. I'm going to go to Scratch MIT. You will have to create your own account. I have an account. And I'm going to log in. And once I'm here, uh, you know, it's pretty much here are the featured projects. This is the other thing. This is a really good time to explain to kids what hacking means, what it should mean. So when Scratch was created by MIT, one of the things they wanted kids to do or wanted people to do was to understand the scratching or the scratching, the hacker community, which is a community of people who share ideas. It's not about stealing things or breaking into other people's stuff. And so you can see that they have all of these different games projects that people have done. Here's the coolness. Here is the coolness. So if I go down here and pick this particular game, it loads it up for me and I can click on the flag and I can play it. And it gives me a little countdown to tell me when it's ready to play. And I go down here and I click on the right color and if I get the right color, it comes down here, so on and so on. That's pretty cool. If I want to see what the code was for that game, I come over here to where it says see inside. There's the code. And if you'll notice down here, it says backpack. 
I can copy the code, take it and put it down here into my backpack so that when I go and start my own, I can have that code and I can just drag it back up in here. Now that is, I, to me, when I show this to kids, this is the part that they think um, is the best. So let's go back here and let's start a, a new uh, game. Our game is all about this sort of, we've called it shark attack. Let's take you around the screen. I'll program for a little bit with you and then I'm gonna let you finish it. And I'll show you how to put it into your Google Classroom. Like I said, the only bad thing about uh, Scratch right now is it does not have hooks into the Google Classroom. Um, I'm on their listserv and they're working on that functionality as we speak. So let's go across the screen. As you can see up here, this is where you're going to title it. So I'm gonna call mine uh, Steve's Game. You can call it whatever you want. And it drops me into here, so I'm ready to go. But just so you can see it over here, here's your save it now, load from your computer, save to your computer. You can actually save these games down onto your computer and it comes down as a file that you can then upload to other places. So if you wanted to upload this as an attachment into a Google assignment, you can do that and it will play. Uh, I think it plays within, we'll try it. We'll, we'll try that. We'll put it down and we'll see if it'll load, upload it into the Google Classroom and play. Um, the way I'm gonna show you is, is basically done through a link. But that then throws you back over here into Scratch. And maybe you wanna do that, maybe you don't. Uh, edit is the, you know, turn on tur turbo mode so things move fast, I don't know. Tutorials, this is, teaches you how to use everything in here. So let's go ahead and look over here. This is your tabs, this is your code, here are your codes. The thing I hope you'll notice when you start doing this project is it's all color coded. You can't mess this up. You go and find the code, you find the color that it is, you match it up with these here. Costumes. You can actually create your own costume for, of any sprite. You can change it up and make it your own. Sounds. You can create your own sound. I know kids, when they create games, they love to make their own sounds. Um, as you can see over here, we have a sound called meow that goes with our little buddy that we just created, but you can make your own. I'm gonna go back here, I'm gonna to go to code. Now I'm gonna go clear across. This is with the work area. This is where you actually do the creating. And then over here, this is where you see what you have created. This little guy right here is called a sprite. Uh, nothing more than an image, a picture. And we don't really want him. You'll notice there's a tray down here. The tray is where all of your sprites and everything that you use, this is where they live. I'm closing some tabs out, excuse me. And you'll see that you have multiple room and then you can do things. You could choose different sprites from right here. I need to move my over a little bit. You also have the ability to choose backgrounds and there they are. There's your backgrounds right there. All right, so the first thing I wanna do because my story is not gonna be about a kitty cat, it's gonna be about a shark, is I'm gonna get rid of that sprite and now I'm gonna go in here and I'm going to go look for a sprite. Notice you can do it under different characters. Also notice when you move your mouse over, some of them move. That comes into effect when we look at something called next costume or change costume. Remember I said about the dragon, if you wanna do an homage, there's a dinosaur. Here he is. So we can actually have a dragon be a part if you wanna go, if you wanna do that. Uh, dogs walk. Dinosaurs do goofy things, okay? So we're gonna use a shark. So I'm gonna go down here and I'm gonna find my friend, the shark. Also notice if I went up here and clicked on animals, yeah, it makes it a little bit easier to find things because you know what you're looking for. 
And I think I would use the puffer fish instead of the octopus as the one I don't want to eat. Notice when I do the shark, it shows me that he has other costumes. And this is kind of like a flip book if you think about it. Now, there's another shark over here who basically just looks like a shark and he kind of noses through the water. But I'm going to use this guy. So now I have a shark. The next thing I need to do is pick a background. By the way, you can change this in the middle of it. Uh, just like anything, if you want to change the look of it and you decided that you would rather have that look instead of the look that you first picked, you go right ahead and change it. We are going to look for underwater. To doom. And now I have a background. There's my guy. Okay. Notice I have him selected. That means now that I can add code to this and I can make him start doing other things. It's just that it's simple, guys. So the first code that I probably want to look at, or the first thing that I always want to look at, because as I work with code, you have to understand that each sprite has its own distinct code. And so each sprite must know what to do. And so every time you start, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to tell it that you need to turn on an event. Okay? Because you want it to always start by looking at the flag. So we're going to go to uh, events when flag is clicked. Okay. The second thing we're going to do is we're going to keep score. Keeping score you do with adding what's called a variable. And when you do that, you're going to come down here and you're going to make a variable unless it's already been made. And if it has, then it's there. And what you're going to do is you're going to change the name of the variable and see if it has in here already. It isn't. That's okay because I can make it my variable by coming up here, make a variable. I'm going to call this thing eaten. Call it anything you want. Now, I only want it to work, though, for my shark because I want to keep track of what he's doing. So I'm going to say okay. Now I'm going to come over here, and you see it already dropped it in. Set the variable to zero. Click it in. Just that easy. Now the next thing is when we talk about coding, one of the things we talk about are routines and subroutines. So we're going to build a subroutine first, and then we're going to put a big surrounding routine around it. And so the first thing I want to do is I want to go to movement. And I'm looking for how I'm going to have my little sprite guy here react to the uh, introduction of the mouse. Okay? Because I want him to follow my mouse around. So I'm going to go up here and go look in the movement section. And I want him to go and point to the mouse pointer. Okay? So I'm going to grab that, and I'm going to pull that in. Now, you notice I can look at what it might change to be. It could be random position, but I want it to be mouse pointer. So I'm going to change that to mouse pointer. Then I want him to move. So when I do that, I'm going to come up here, and I'm going to move. The default is 10 steps. Now, this is what I was talking about earlier. If you want to make this different, in other words, make it your own, you just come in here and you can change up what this number is in here. It's just that easy. You can make him move 20 or 2 or 25. Play around with it. See which one you like the best. When he's moving around and he hits the edge of the screen, I want him to bounce back into the action that's going on. So, in other words, I don't push him off and he disappears off the screen. Kids go crazy when it does that. Here's the next one. Next is show. And we're going to show 
our different costumes. And that is under looks. You know, they changed this over the years, and so I'm not as adept at finding them as I used to be. Here we go, looks. We're going to change this to next costume. Now again, this is where you can change it up if you want to. So if I just put next costume in here, what he's gonna do is this character over here will just flip to the next costume. Now it says, that I can wait so many seconds before he changes back. So that's one way you can do it. Now the wait is a control. So I can go in here and I can do a control and I can say, well, this is how long the wait is going to happen before it changes back. Okay. So I can come in here and I can say, I want you to wait. And I want you to wait not too long. So I'm going to go in here and do a 0 0.1. 0 0.1. All right. Now, if you come over here and click on the flag, watch. He moved. Okay. He didn't move very far, but he moved. Let me drag him back down here. We'll stop it. Let's hit it. And you see he moved. He was trying to get up to where my mouse pointer was. We want it to be like that all the time. We want this to be happening all the time. And so that is, we're looking for something called a forever. We're going to bring this over. It will open its mouth and it will eat all of our little subroutine that we put in here. Just like that. And now... What we can do when we hit the flag this time and we move our mouse in here, he starts following our mouse around. And you, as you can see, he's eating. Just that easy. Hit the stop sign. Okay. Now, I might want to change some of this up, and I've already shown you how to do that. Just go in here and change. What would happen if we changed him? Quit moving. What if we changed him instead of the 20? What if we gave him five? Hit the green flag. And as you can see, he's a much more slower, deliberate guy than he was. Also notice when I get to the edge, he doesn't go off the edge. Okay. I'll stop this. What would happen if I made it go really fast? Now I've got a really fast swimming. And if you notice when he hits the edges this time, he's actually bouncing back into the field of play. Let's do one last thing down here. Let's take out that next costume bit. So I'm going to pull off. I'm just pulling things off and dropping them over here. And... <clears throat> I'm going to pull out the next costume and I'm going to drop that over here as well. Because what I really would like to do is to define what I want that costume to be. So if you come back down here, where will we find costumes? Remember? Looks. So let's go and find the looks screen. And I showed you that there was one called next costume and then there's another one that says um, switch costume. So what if I put the switch costume in? Let's go and put that in. Okay. Now notice that it says it can switch to shark 2A, switch to shark 2B, switch to shark, shark 2C. So let's go ahead and change that up to B. And now let's do our green flag. And as you can see, B must be the same thing as the <laughs> initial one because he's got his mouth wide open. So let's go ahead and change that. And let's come back and let's change that to A. Hit it. 
Okay, and now I can have it change to that. Well, you know, you see what I'm showing you here is, is when you make changes, you could make the changes or you can have it do it automatically. What would happen, do you think, if we towed it to change it again? And this time we left it at A. Let's see. So we go in here. He's not really changing, is he? So we would either want to introduce maybe a time where he would change based upon how long we want him to be before we go to the next costume. So I hope you're seeing how easy this is. Oh, let's do this. Here, let's pull all this out. This could get really kind of interesting. Let's go ahead and put the next costume back in. And this basically what he's going to do is just go through the, the costumes, right? And we want to change his size by 10. That could be interesting looking. Now, remember, we've got to add in, when we do this, we've got to add in that control. So let's go up here to control. Hello, control. Here we are. We can wait. We're going to plug that in here. Oh, let me show you what it does when you when you have it at a high setting, like one second. Show you what it does. It's kind of cool. Okay. You notice we're just going five. And do you see what it's doing? It's changing the size. Let's clean this up a little bit. So I'm going to go in here and I'm going to make this the point one seconds. And now let's add a point one seconds down here. We're going to change this to point one seconds. And we're going to change its size back. Okay. So let's see. Uh, looks, 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 looks. You do a lot of scrolling <laughs> until you finally learn where everything is. And as I said, they changed it on me. All right, so here we go. We're going to change the size by, we did it by 10. Let's do it by five. Let's make this a five. As always, we come over here and we do our flag. Now we have a very big giant and he's getting bigger and bigger as the game plays. So we can say, eh, I don't think we want to do that. So I'm going to pull those pieces out. Just drag them out. Drag it out. Okay. Let's stop it. Let's do it again. And now we have our guy, he's nice and big again. And he's eating away. Okay? Simple as that. Our next set of code, you can do. You can do the next set of code. So we're going to come down here, and we're now going to add a new... And again, this is where you can make it your own. Come in here and find the fish or come in and find a frog. Come in and find a whatever you want to make your next sprite to be. And notice when I pick my clownfish over here, this clears out. And so now I have to start putting in the code that would control my little fish. And here he is up here. That's simple. Now, if you screw up and you want to just start over, well, you can do that a couple of ways. You can go back in and you can just delete this guy out and bring a new one in. Um, you could throw your code away. 
But I think the thing that, that when I do this with kids, what I try to get them to understand is there's nothing wrong with playing. There is nothing wrong with playing and seeing what things work to do what. Oh, let's put one more thing in while we're here. Let's play a sound until done. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to drag that in and I'm going to put it up here because I want it to start right there. Now notice it says you've got some sounds already in here and I've got one called bite so that when I play the game, you can't hear it, but I can hear it going chomp, chomp, chomp. Now it's not doing it over and over again, which is what I want it to do. So I'm going to pull it out from where it was, pull the forever away, pull this out, put the forever back. And now I'm going to put my sound in with the forever. And now when I play the game, it sounds like he's chomping. He's just going chomp, 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 chomp. That, my friends, is Scratch. I'm going to uh, save the project page. I'm now going to share it. And once I've done that, I can, this is how you get it into your Google Classroom. I can copy the link. And you think I would learn to keep my classroom open. I can go back to my classroom. And in the assignment, you know, that I had, I can come up and I can add my part to it. And I can make that a, I can put the link in there. Excuse me. Well, I don't have one that's an assignment. I'm sorry. But that's how you do it. Just go to the assignment, put the link in, paste in yours. Okay, that's what I'm going to do for this. I'm not going to go any further than that because you don't need to sit here and watch me drag code over. You can do it just as fast as I can. Now, let me talk about the final. So in our final, oh, by the way, there's lots and lots of scratch things in here. Um, if you've never done Scratch Kahoot, please try. If you've never done Kahoot, please try. Our final. As I said, April 23. It is so simple. It is just basically asking you to reflect back on what you've done. And I don't want the great American novel. I want just your thinking. If you want to put anything into it, like a link back to the page that you're talking about that you created in your Google Classroom, please do that. Um, also remember, I've talked about this uh, ad nauseum, but the poor live text does not understand uh, the idea about links. So if you put a link into the live text, is a part of your reflection and it doesn't look like it does anything. Don't panic. Don't worry. When I see links in somebody's work, all I do is highlight it and I right click and say open in a new tab and it brings it right up. So here we go. We're going to be looking at the first reflection is the TPAC process. Um, when we talked about the virtual classroom, the flip classroom, talk about TPAC framework and how your Google Classroom web creations reflect the idea of novel, effective, and whole. In other words, what are you doing? What are you doing that reflects the ideas behind the TPAC, where the technology is not the first thing, it's the last thing, where we look at tools are ways for kids to demonstrate understanding, and those tools then are unique, to use uh, Fullen's terms, irresistibly engaging, Effective, in other words, kids can create, and whole. Whole meaning that they basically reflect the curricular uh, focus that you have. It's not just go out and make something goofy. It actually has a purpose. 
The next one is, this goes into detail about your design, your redesign, and how you see, and this is a straight lift from Fullen, how do you see your Google Classroom meeting his four criteria? Okay. Next one, this is the easiest one. Reflect upon the interactive resources you created for the class. Think about how you see the, the digital native. You know, are, are they real? Based upon what you've read, are they real? And what are their strengths? What are their flaws? Okay. What technologies that you've played with, and boy, we've played with lots, do you see that would be a use for students in your classroom? Okay. Now, you'll notice I always say virtual classroom up here. I, I'm going to... I had a long conversation with myself last year, I do that a lot, over using this term. And I think I've gotten to the point where with all the convergence I'm seeing out there, the only time that the only time that we don't see technology used is in a classroom where the teacher chooses not to use. The amount of technology that is now available to you as a teacher has reached the tipping point. We can choose to ignore it still, but we shouldn't because it's that much a part of school now. So all this is doing is, what did you like? Well, I like the Google Classroom. What did you like about the Google Classroom? I really like the Nearpod. Yeah, I do too. <laughs> so, you know, you're just going to do that. Notice it says S technologies. So please do at least two. And as you consider developing that Google Classroom, which part, which part is going to be the most comfortable for you to do? And which part makes you still kind of go, eh, I'm not ready. I don't know if I'm really ready to do this. That's it. That's your final. Uh, I hope that it isn't as overwhelming to you. I hope it's as straightforward as I can make it. And I hope that you will take the time to really think about it as you're writing again. I don't need the great American novel. I need two or three paragraphs. And I want you to think about, think about the stuff that we've done in here um, and how you see yourself becoming that teacher who is an advocate for the use of technology at your school. As always, I'm available for you. We've got plenty of time before the end of class. Um, if you need to talk with me, um, I said the 23rd, but as I look here, you would have really to the 25th of April to get everything turned in. And as always, if you need to talk with me about anything that we've done, I'm at 502-457-2937. Those of you who have Google Classrooms that I'm linked to, I'm thoroughly enjoying watching the stuff come in. Um, I will hopefully hear and or see from you again. I hope you'll take other courses. Uh, we've kind of mentioned the there's an online course I teach, which is, a, which is Google Classroom Gone Deep and really looking at the implications for what we do in Google Classroom and how we can actually run a virtual classroom that actually um, embodies the ideas of uh, kids sharing ideas and building upon ideas. Uh, we have a class where we talk about our good friends from Wiggins and McTeague and the universal design. I also have a class where I teach universal design. I also teach a class for understanding by design, the Wiggins and McTeague stuff. And we also have a class that I, everybody goes nuts. They love it to death. It's called Multimedia. Um, we do a heavy, deep dive, just like we did with the Fullen book. We do a deep dive into a book by a guy by the name of Richard Mayer. And then it's all fun and games. I know I shouldn't say that, but it truly is. It's all fun and games after that because we play with every kind of multimedia development tool that's out there for you to use with kids. It's not a class on learning how to program in Flash. It's a class on you developing content using web-based tools. As always, I'm here for you. Just let me know if you need any help. Thank you.